Today I'll be taking your questions while enjoying a rum from Puerto Rico. Hello and welcome to another installment of Behind the Glass with a Glass. I'm Nick Carver and today we're doing something a little different. Today I'm going to be answering your questions. Just a couple days ago on Instagram I asked you to submit any question you want, hopefully photography related, and many of you obliged. I received a total of 158 questions. A lot more than I expected. That's great. Um, we won't be getting through all those today. I'm just going to chip away at as many as I can in about, I don't know, 20 minutes or whatever. Um, so that's what we're doing. But let me tell you first what I'm enjoying here. This is Don Q Gran Añejo Puerto Rican Rum. And I chose a rum today because, uh, well, I'm in full summer mode, baby. The beard says winter, but everything else says summer. I'm wearing my linen shirt, which is unbuttoned uncomfortably low. Got my Sperry's on. I'm ready for the beach, baby. And uh, I figured a rum would suit that mood nicely. So uh, a little while back, I did a behind the glass with a glass where I reviewed uh, Diplomatico Venezuelan rum. And uh, damn, that's a good rum. And uh, so many people chimed in saying, you got to try Gran Añejo. Don Cued, Gran Añejo. So many people chimed in, I said, I got to try it. So I picked up a bottle. And as you can see from the amount that has been consumed, I've enjoyed this rum quite, quite a bit as well. Now, it's a lot different than Diplomatico. Diplomatico is a... Uh, uh, a much sweeter rum. I think it's a little easier to drink. Uh, Diplomatico is a lot like a, uh, a fine port, a, like a tawny port, as I mentioned in that video. This is a little more like sipping whiskey. Um, and in fact, this is aged, uh, I believe, three to 12 years in old uh, whiskey or bourbon barrels. Um, and it's a fine glass of rum. I really like it. To me, the, the palate is very dark chocolatey. Um, I don't see any of that in the notes about this, but uh, when I take a nice sip, the last taste I'm getting is dark chocolate. And it goes down smooth. So this is very enjoyable. I do recommend it. It'll run you about 50 to $60. So, I mean, it's not the cheapest rum in the world, but it's not, gonna, it's not anything insane. And uh, wine enthusiast gives it a 92, so pretty good score. Um, so I do recommend it, Don Q Gran Añejo. Now you may notice my laptop's missing. I've opted for an iPad as we go through the, uh, the Q&A. So I'm just gonna start chipping away at some of the questions. Now many of the questions, well I shouldn't say many, some of the questions are uh, came up multiple times. And a few people ask the same question. I'm actually going to start with those uh, because I figured it must be a popular topic if that many people are asking about it. All right, so I'm going to start off with a question that came up many times. Uh, but this one in particular was asked by Life is Instant. Must be a Polaroid fan. It says, obviously you love your Shen Hao and your RZ67, but have you or do you shoot any 35 millimeter? A lot of people asked if I, if I do 35 millimeter ever. And uh, the answer is... No, not really. Um, not because I have anything against it. Uh, it's just, to be honest, it's, it's too many damn frames per roll. <laughs> That's really the main reason. 36 pictures just feels like it's never going to end, man. Um, I tend to be very selective on my photos. I prefer a much slower shooting style, but keep in mind, I'm shooting a lot of buildings and desert landscapes and rocks and trees. So I, I don't need a whole lot of frames. I can take my time on my subjects. And 35 millimeter always just felt like way too many frames. Um, every time I shoot 35 millimeter, I get halfway through the roll and I'm like, Jesus, is this thing done yet? And I'm looking at the counter. I'm like, oh my God, it's going to take forever. Um, case in point, I have a roll of HP5 uh, in my Canon EOS 1V that I loaded in months ago. And I think I have four frames left. I can't figure out what to shoot with it. So uh, it's just too many pictures. But that being said, um, I love good 35 millimeter photography, especially black and white street photography. You know, if I got into street photography, 35 millimeter would probably be the way to go. Now, I, with 35 millimeter, I always have these grand ideas of like, oh, if I have a camera that's small and I can take with me, 
I'll take so many more pictures, I'll start doing street photography and I'll start doing candid portraits of my wife and I'll do little slice of life photos. But come on, that's not gonna happen. I have a camera with me all the time and I never use it. Why would I start doing that uh, just because I have you know, a 35 millimeter camera? So I've learned to stick to the cameras that uh, are fewer frames. My six by 17 gives me four frames. That's plenty for me in uh, those types of photos that I do with that camera. And then uh, 645 is about the smallest format I go. Next question, uh, several people asked this question too. But Louis Theron 94 asked, do you still use your, your Fuji X-Pro2? Oh, look at that, it's right here. <laughs> um, yeah, so I love this camera, I really do. I don't find myself using it all that much. Um, but I will tell you, it's, it's become my go-to tool for two very specific situations. Um, number one is, this is my travel camera. So if I'm doing a lot of air travel, I prefer bringing this over a film camera. Um, and I know that's kind of heresy in the film photography community. Shouldn't I be bringing a film camera? But uh, let me just tell you a little bit of the hassles that come with that. So when I travel to like, uh, let's say New York, did that last year with my wife and my brother. Um, I brought a film camera, I brought my Minolta, or I'm sorry, my uh, Fuji GA645ZI, and I brought my X-Pro2. I found myself using the X-Pro2 pretty much the entire time. And the reason for that is, I just didn't wanna go through another goddamn security checkpoint where I had to ask for a hand check on my film. And you might think, oh, it's just the airports. Nah, it nah, ain't. I went to the 9-11 uh, uh, Museum, which was incredible, by the way, uh, and that had a security checkpoint. So I had my camera in my bag. I wasn't gonna take pictures in there, but if I had film with me, I would have to hand check it. It's just traveling with film is really annoying. So unless I really wanna shoot film at that location, I just bring in my X-Pro2 now. Um, so if I'm doing air travel to any great distance, this is probably the only camera I'm bringing. I'm going to Maui next year. I think this is probably the only camera I'm gonna bring. I, I doubt I'm gonna bring a film camera. It's just so much more convenient. And you know, anyone who knows a Fuji knows it's a lot like using a film camera. And I think I'm gonna be using it more if, you know, once all this pandemic stuff calms down and I get a little more air travel into my life, this is probably gonna be a bigger part of my life too. So that's situation one where this very much comes in handy. It just doesn't come in handy all that often. The second situation is uh, uh, I use this camera to take pictures uh, for my wife. She has a, a really great blog on uh, fashion. Her fashion is her passion. So um, what photography is to me, fashion is to her. And she has a blog where she talks a lot about it. Important stuff too, sustainability and um, you know buying quality over quantity. Stuff I, I can really get behind as well. But I do all of her photos and I do it with the X-Pro2 because I love the colors. I love the look of it. Uh, I love the tonalities. It's got that Fuji look that my Canon just isn't going to give me. Um, and I can bring it, you know, with me when we travel to New York or something like that. And I can take pictures of her in New York and I don't got to be fumbling with a medium format camera and uh, film and all that kind of stuff when I'm trying to just uh, walk around town with something lightweight. So I really do love this camera. I'm so glad I bought it. I just don't find myself using it all that much lately because most of my travel lately is just driving to a location and doing the more slowed down, um, large format type stuff. Is there a cure for medium format addiction? And that comes from Tim Sultan. I don't know, is there a cure for being too handsome? Is there a cure for being uh, too muscly? Is there a cure for having too chiseled of a jaw? No, man, you're good, Tim Salton. You're beautiful just the way you are. There's nothing to cure. Keep that uh, medium format addiction going strong because it's healthy, buddy. Not including photographers. Which artists inspire your photography? That comes from Ryan Ikuchi. I'm sure I butchered your name, sorry, buddy. Um, not including photographers, which artists inspire your photography? Okay, I got a lot to say about this because I'm personally a big advocate of finding inspiration from sources that are outside your medium of choice. Um, I actually don't view very much photography. Like my Instagram is not a bunch of photographers. I tend to follow random stuff, feeds that show people falling, 
There's one called Scorpion Masters. It's one of my favorite. It just shows people falling in such a way that they do scorpion tail. So I, I just follow stupid things, um, but I also follow painters. And uh, when I look at art books, I don't have a whole lot of photography coffee table books, but um, I do like to look at books of uh, painters. So I, I, the reason I like to get inspiration from artists that are not in my field is I, I feel that if I get it from other photographers, it can be too direct. And I will start to mimic their style too much, largely out of admiration for them. The perfect example is Greg Recruitson. He's one of the only photographers that I actually look at his work. I have a coffee table book that normally sits right here that's Greg Recruitson's images. And I've had people tell me how much my style uh, reminds them of Greg Recruitson. And I take that as a huge compliment, but it just goes to show that his work is pretty directly influencing my photography because we're working in the same mediums. So um, it's naturally gonna be more of a direct copy. But if I find inspiration from other artists, uh, I find it's, uh, I can kind of turn it into my own and then put it out as my own uh, creativity. So some of the artists that really inspire me, there's a painter that's been inspiring me for many years. He's based in Pasadena. His name is Kenton Nelson. And um, I love his paintings. You'll actually notice uh, my compositions are pretty strongly influenced by the way he paints. Very straight lines, a lot of straight ons of buildings, uh, very clean, sharp shadows. And uh, that's been a, a big source of inspiration for me. Um, another artist is a sculptor. His name is Michael Heiser. Um, and he made the, the piece, in, at, I think, at LACMA, L.A. Um, Modern Art Museum. And uh, it's a levitated mass. It's this giant boulder levitating over a, you know, a walkway you can go under. He, he's one of those artists where I know it's easy to brush him off. Oh, modern art is so stupid. You just moved a rock. How is that art? But to me, it's very inspiring, a lot of his work. Um, he, he creates these things. He has like a compound out in the desert or something where he just makes these giant sculptures. And it, it's, it's almost like a town of these giant sculptures. I don't even know why it's out there. I don't know who's allowed to go see it. It's like he has this thing in his brain where he can't sleep unless he makes this thing that he's seeing in his brain. It's like he's under the command of some other uh, influence. And that to me is really inspirational because his work is interesting in the first place, the way he works with space, um, but also he's doing something that's so unique to him. And to me, is, that's inspirational. In fact, uh, in my most recent on location video where I went out to Mojave Desert, I shot a lot of pictures on, uh, of rocks in black and white, just playing with the shadows and the highlights. I realized afterwards that's very strongly influenced by my, uh, my love for Michael Heiser's work because he does a lot of stuff with just kind of rocks and, and playing with shadows and highlights on those rocks. Um, so that's another artist. But also, um, you know, it doesn't have to be visual arts. Uh, I get huge inspiration from Johnny Cash. That's a, his music just makes me feel a, a certain way. It creates a world that I can, in, in, you know, immerse myself in that really feeds my, uh, my love for the desert and the type of images that I create. I mean, you can find inspiration from anywhere, but I think getting it from other artists that aren't in your field is, um, is a really smart move. In fact, this is gonna be, it sounds like a weird one, but there was an episode of The Simpsons where Homer ate, uh, went to a chili cook-off and he ate this uh, chili that was so hot he started um, hallucinating and he went on like this wild peyote trip through the desert with saguaro cactus and there was a coyote talking to him who incidentally was voiced by Johnny Cash. He's hallucinating all this stuff, of course, but the, the whole vibe of that episode of The Simpsons is something that's like always in the back of my brain. Like when I'm making my YouTube videos or when I'm out taking pictures in the desert, that's actually playing a strong influence. That sounds so weird, but that is an art form, man. Someone had to draw that. Someone had to come up with that. Someone had to come up with that storyline. Like everything about it is inspirational to me. So absolutely, I do get inspiration from other artists and uh, those are just a few of them. Oh, there's another one. I know I'm making it seem like it's all desert and Johnny Cash and all this kind of stuff. Um, but it's not just that. I just tend to gravitate towards that. Sorry, Ooh, it's coming back up a little bit. 
Um, there's another artist in uh, Palm Springs uh, named Danny Heller that does really cool mid-century modern paintings that are kind of, uh, I wouldn't say hyper-realistic, but they're very realistic. And I love his work. He's another guy I follow on Instagram. So, um, yes, I find a lot of inspiration from other artists, and I recommend it for everyone else. All right. If you had to choose, what would you say is your favorite image you've ever taken? Only one. That's from uh, the Six Million P-Man. Um, I like that he put only one. He's holding me to it. Um, I would have to say my image, uh, Desert Layers, number one. Um, that might be my favorite picture. That's actually what's hanging in my office. And aside from actually liking the image itself, to me it more represents a very important shift in my photography. And it tends to remind me of that, so I have a lot of uh, appreciation and affection for it. Um, right around that time, I was going through a pretty rough patch in trying to find my style. I was really struggling and I was kind of all over the map. I was doing high saturation stuff up until then, just the you know epic punch you in the face landscape, high saturation type stuff. Um, and I was starting to transition out of that. I was burned out on it. I couldn't do it anymore. And I, I was trying to find a new style and I felt kind of like I was adrift in a sea of like no direction. And um, I was struggling, I was grasping at things. I was shooting all sorts of different styles and formats and different subjects and it, it was just, it was kind of a cluttered mess. And that was one of the first pictures where I actually felt like I had honed in on something, something deeper that I hadn't honed in on before, that I hadn't let myself acknowledge before. And I know this sounds, this all sounds so pretentious and like so important talking about photography. I know this sounds kind of ridiculous, but um, up until that point, I, I feel like I was basically doing my best impression of other photographers. Uh, I still feel like I'm doing that sometimes, but um, I was just kind of doing my best impression of the images that I admired, but I wasn't really tapping into anything that was true to me. And I, I no matter how much I lied to myself, um, the fact of the matter was I was taking pictures that I, I thought people would like. And so I was taking pictures that I thought would get a reaction. And high saturation gets a reaction. Certain types of compositions get a reaction. Um, and I, I had been doing that up until that point. I would never admit it at the time. No, I'm taking these pictures because I really care about an epic landscape of a rock with water around it. I really care about that. But I wasn't, I, I really wasn't. I wasn't doing pictures that were truly coming from deep inside. And then when I took that picture, I didn't do an on location for that that uh, picture and I'm glad I didn't because I, I was kind of, it let me be in the moment of taking that photo. I remember very distinctly taking that photo and when I was taking it, I was having so much fun. Like, fun might not even be the right word. I was so comfortable. I was so just not caring. I wasn't giving two shits about what anyone would think about this picture when I took it. But I was so interested in taking it. And that feeling is something I try and keep going in my photography. Not caring about what other people are, how other people are going to react to it. And by the way, that's really difficult to do. It's still very difficult for me to do, especially since I know if I'm doing an on location video, I want those positive comments, man, I'm human. But I try and approach pictures now the way I approach that photo. Don't give a crap if anyone likes it. I'm printing it. I'm printing it six foot, six foot wide. I'm putting it on my wall. Anyone else who doesn't like it can take a hike. Pardon my French, but they can take a hike. Um, so I really like that photo because it, it marks a transition in my photography where I, I was getting much more comfortable in my style and, and much more comfortable in my ability to take pictures that I didn't know if anyone would like it, but also didn't really care. Um, it took me a long time to get to that place. So that, that picture was kind of the start of it. And by the way, I don't want to make it seem like I got it all figured out. I definitely don't. I still very much find myself hoping people are going to like my pictures more than I should or, or thinking too much about how, the, how people are going to react. It's a, it's a hard trap to get out of, but um, that was kind of the first start of me trying to get out of it. How do you balance between business and art? It comes from Cozy Sloth. I think it's very important to strike a, a good balance between, you know, Professional work and personal work. Um, 
it's hard to strike that balance sometimes because bills got to get paid and that actually is the most important thing. Uh, bills do need to get paid. So uh, I tend to put work first, but I try and force myself to turn down jobs when I don't really need the money so that I can go out camping, uh, take pictures, do an on location video, all that stuff that very much uh, feeds the um, uh, non-business side of me, feeds my soul, I guess. Uh, I've found it's very important to pursue that stuff, even though it does not make money. Um, earlier on in my photography career, in my late 20s or mid 20s or whatever, uh, and this is the case for everybody and it should be this way, it's a lot of hustle, man. You have to pound the pavement, you gotta work hard because you're trying to get your, your head above water, you're trying to get the business stable enough to where you can step back from it a bit, but you have to put in that work first. You gotta put in that work early. So in my 20s, I was just hustling really hard to get my business up to the point that you see it today where I can do YouTube videos and I can do things that cost money and I can buy cameras that I want and I can relax a little bit and I don't have to shoot, you know, six buildings a week. I can, I can relax a little bit. And that's great that I put in that work, but during that time, buddy, my art suffered big time. Uh, and I hate to call it my art, my, my art, man, I gotta be wearing a turtleneck, but um, the, the passion projects, let's put it that way, uh, my personal work suffered immensely during that time because there's just not enough time to put into it. You're too busy trying to trying to get a business going, man. You're too busy, busy trying to hustle. You're too busy trying to pay bills. Um, but now I'm very fortunate. Uh, my business is coasting along evenly enough because of all the hard work I put in in previous years that I can work on personal work. Um, but you know, if you're in a situation where you do have to hustle hard and you don't really have a whole lot of time for personal work, do try and carve out the time. I could have spent a lot more time working on personal projects instead of, I don't know, watching Netflix or something. Like there is more time in the day. I could have, I could have done better at it even though I was hustling to get my, my business up and running. Um, so I think it's really important to balance that. I'm pretty good at it now, but you know, the nature of my business is when the work is there, I don't turn it down uh, because it can, it can do a lot of this. It's kind of feast or famine sometimes. So I'll go, a couple weeks, three weeks, couple months, where it's just nonstop pounding, pounding the pavement and I am so getting so burned out. But then just all of a sudden, it's gone. And I, I have two weeks of suddenly like nothing. So that's when I try and use the time to work on personal projects um, or I try and turn down jobs when I don't really need it. Um, it's important to strike that balance though and it's difficult to do, it takes some effort. Um, worst photography trend, present or past? And that comes from Max Schetzel, Schetzel, sorry, I'm butchering your name, I'm sure. Um, worst photography trend, present or past? I'll say the past was uh, the HDR craze of like the you know mid 2000s. Um, not, I'm not talking HDR where you can't tell it's HDR, not the natural looking HDR. Of course, I'm not talking about that because if you can't tell it's HDR, then that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the stuff where you look at it and it makes your eyes itch because they 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 push the HDR hyper surreal button and it's like all cracked and too much texture and it's always like some ultra wide angle thing with like, I don't know, some car right up in a 14 millimeter lens. Like it's just, ugh, ugh it's terrible. Um, so I'd say that's the worst past trend. I think that's mostly gone, which is good. Um, worst present trend. <sighs> I'm gonna get myself in trouble here. But there's this breed of cat that um, I don't even know, how, how do I describe their work? Um, it's, okay, it's digital, but that's not why it's bad. It seems to always be shot on a Sony A7R three or whatever they call it. That's not why it's bad. Don't walk away just yet, Sony users. I'll, I got more to say. Um, it's like this, the best I can describe the image is they're all dynamic range, all clarity, and no soul. Like there's just nothing about these photos that is anything artistic. They hide behind creativity. Oh, these pictures are super creative. But guess what, sweetheart? Creativity isn't art. Creativity just means you came up with something that other people didn't. Um, but maybe there's a reason no one came up with it before. 
Uh, it's really hard to describe the, the style. Um, okay, I don't like calling people out because that's not really, it's not really my MO. But if I give you a couple names of people that, that do this style, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and unfortunately, I've come across these profiles thanks to a really funny Instagram feed you should follow, Trendy Photography Memes. Follow that feed, it's hilarious. They poke fun at my type of photographer, every other type of photographer, it's hilarious. Um, but anyway, so Jordy Co Coalitic, Co Coalitic, something like that. Um, lots of like hyper edited, uh, creative I guess, but they're not really, I don't know what these pictures are about, like they're not, they're not like communicating anything real deep or profound about the artist or about their their perspective on the world or anything like that. It's just like a bunch of super in-your-face epic shots. Uh, another one, uh, Seventh Era. This feed looks exactly the same. <laughs> like, again, uh, Sony and the, they're apparently using all the same presets. Oh, that's the other thing. They all sell presets and I'm guessing they're all just trading and using the same presets because... You could shuffle up any one of these profiles and you wouldn't be able to pick one out. North Borders is another one. Looks exactly the same as all these other guys. Um, Hados Peterson looks exactly the same as all these other guys. Like they're all using the same presets. They're all using smoke bombs and lens balls. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what they're trying to show with their art, quote unquote art. That's the other thing. They all fancy themselves artists. I hate even calling myself an artist. It feels pretentious. But um, I don't know. I, I, I hate that trend. I think those pictures are hideous. Uh, but again, that's just me. I get it. It's a personal preference thing. Um, by the way, I know in previous videos, I, I rag on Sony a lot. I do it partly just because it's hilarious. Um, they're clearly the best cameras. I know that. Their image sensors are better than Canon's and whatever, whoever else's. If you're just looking at specs and if, you know, resolution, dynamic range, and sharpness are the things you care about most, yeah, they're the best sensors. I get it. Um, their cameras are a lot better than they used to be, too. I mean, Sony designs their cameras like they're daring you to use them, but uh, their control layout has gotten a little bit better. But I can't help but poke fun at them when I see those guys. Like, when I hear, oh, I bought a, I bought a Sony A7R three or whatever, all I picture is, like, the Sony uh, shoved in my face like this and like hands coming at you like this and it's all wide angle and just hyper clarity and the colors are all thrown out and, and hue is changed on every color and it's just like, yeah, in your face, yeah, here's a lens ball, here's a flame and here's like lights coming at you. It's like, I don't know, it's cool, I guess, but how much of that do you really need? So that's the current trend I'm not into. Um, so Sony users, I'm sorry. I love, I do love you. I promise. Uh, one of my best friends is a Sony user. Uh, my wedding photographer was a Sony user. I get it. Their cameras are phenomenal. I just can't get the Jordy Colitics out of my head when I think of Sony, but that's my own problem. And I get it. We're all full of shit, man. I'm a dumb film hipster that uses a camera from the late 1800s and thinks he's an artist just because he's shooting Kodak portrait. I get it. We're all full of shit. It's fine. All right. Um, is getting a 6x17 back for a 4x5 camera a good way to shoot panos? Uh, and that comes from Alan Corden. Yes, it is. But there are some, some caveats. So if you've seen my, my very early on location videos, you may notice that I shot panoramics 6x17 by using a uh, 6x17 roll film back on my 4x5. Sorry. Need a little more of this. Good, all right. So I used to use a, a roll film back for my 6x17, but I switched to a dedicated 6x17 camera for a couple reasons. One is it's a little slower uh, than using a dedicated 6x17 camera simply because you have a separate viewing um, attachment and a separate film attachment. So you have to put the viewer on and then focus, do your, all that kind of stuff. And then you have to take that off, put it away, grab the roll film and put it on. Um, that just was a little slower than I wanted. Um, my dedicated 6x17, you just flip the ground glass down and then you can 
um, put the roll back on. I know it sounds like a minor thing, but uh, it just frees up one hand for me to do other stuff, operate a meter or whatever. Um, so that was kind of annoying. But the main thing is, um, if you're using a 6x17 back on a 4x5, you're limited in uh, focal lengths that you can use. The shortest focal length you can get away with is about 90 millimeters, and that's on a recessed lens board. So best to have that, that lens on a recessed lens board, and even then, it's hard to compress the bellows enough to use anything wider than 90 millimeters. So like I had a 72 millimeter lens I couldn't use on the 6x17 back. That's because the 6x17 back is so much further away from the 4x5 film plane that you can't compress the bellows enough to get the lens to focus. But also long focal lengths you can't use. The longest focal length you can use is around 180 millimeters, maybe 210 millimeters. So like I had a 300 millimeter lens that I couldn't use with my 6x17 back. Now by the way, it's not because the bellows doesn't extend enough. I had plenty of bellows extension, that's not the problem. The problem is that the way the image circle projects from a lens that long, it's coming in at a very straight angle, and it couldn't get past the 4x5 opening to the bigger 6x17 uh, frame. When it's a shorter focal length, the image circle is bypassing the 4x5 frame because it's coming in at a more extreme angle. So, long story short, the main reason I switched to a dedicated 6x17 is that uh, I could only use focal lengths from 90 millimeters with a recessed board all the way to about 180. And I wanted to be able to use a 300 millimeter, 400 millimeter lens. Um, so a dedicated 6x17, let me do that. All right, how we doing? Oh, okay, let's wrap this up soon. Um, how do you get that retractable cap on your spot meter? You mean this one? You've probably seen me use that a lot in my videos and it is damn nice. I have no idea where you can get them. It came with my meter when I bought it off eBay. I've been looking, it, it attaches with a uh, tripod mount at the bottom and then it's attached to this cap. Um, a viewer tracked down that it, it seems to be a jewelry security retractable thing. And then I don't know where the uh, quarter inch threaded tripod mount came from. I don't know if the guy modified it himself and put it on or something, but Man, if anybody finds how to get this retractable base, please let me know. And then it's just a matter of poking a hole through a plastic cap uh, and, and fitting it over. So, wish I had a better answer for you. Because when this thing finally breaks, I'm going to cry for at least a couple of days. Okay, let's do two more questions. Quick one. Top three cheeses from Why Does Pizza Taste So Good? Man, this guy's all about cheese. Uh, all right, top three cheeses. I know I'm gonna ruffle some feathers here, but here goes. Oaxaca, mozzarella, provolone. I know, I said it. Send your angry letters to my email. Okay, final, final question here. What loop do you use and why for focusing on ground glass? That's the one I was looking for because I have it right here. So I use a Silvestri 6X loop. Um, this is actually designed specifically for uh, ground glass viewing. Uh, a couple things about it. First off, it's 6x, uh, which is just the right magnification for focusing on ground glass, in my opinion. Anything less, uh, it's not uh, really magnified enough, but anything more, like if you get an 8x or a 10x, you're basically just seeing the texture of the ground glass. You can't even really make out the image because it's magnifying it too much. So 6x is a really good um, magnification size. It's very compact, lightweight when it's hanging around your neck. It's not a, a burden. Um, the base is really cool. It's flat, uh, so it goes uh, against the glass quite easy. And it's even got this little uh, triangulated edge, which goes into the corners of the ground glass uh, really well. But the main thing about this that's really cool is you'll notice it pivots on the uh, base. And the reason for that is when you're focusing on the ground glass with a wide angle lens, focusing in the center is pretty easy. You just use this perpendicular and you can focus pretty easy on the center of the image. But with a wide angle lens, the, the lines of, um, well, the angle of light coming in from the lens from the image circle is coming to the edges and corners of the glass at such an extreme angle that if you focus perpendicular like this, uh, it's actually really hard to tell if you're focused on the image. But if you can focus like at the same line 
that the, the image circle is coming in from the lens. So let's say I'm at the lower right corner of the ground glass. I can tilt this like that and then put it down into the corner and actually focus in line with the, the line coming out the back of the lens. So it lets you align the loop with the proper orientation of the uh, image circle coming out the back of the lens. So really great loop. I'll put a, a link to it in the description of this video, but uh, I love this as my, my viewing loop. Okay, I don't know how many we got through there, but it was nowhere near 158. So please let me know in the comments if you like this whole deal, at kind of an ask me anything situation, um, you know, Q&A, and you want me to do another, maybe the next behind the glass or the one after that, I'll chip away at more questions. Maybe we'll just do this until we've gone through all 158, baby, but only if you like it. So let me know in the comments if you liked how this went, um, please let me know. Alrighty, that's it. Go out, get yourself some uh, Don Q Gran Anejo and soak up some Puerto Rico this summer. But until next time, thanks for watching. Cheers.